each other. So, so if you could go to the next slide. Yep. Um, so the first on the left hand side here is, as Megan introduced, a paper called Snakes and Ladders and Loaded Dice. And essentially what we wanted to do in this paper was update some prior research that we'd done on social class, social mobility, um, and poverty dynamics in South Africa with the with the full five waves of the National Income Dynamics Study panel data. So this is really nice longitudinal data in which we follow the same South Africans between 2008 and uh, 2017. And we really observe how, um, how these South Africans, a nationally representative sample of South Africans move into and out of poverty um, over time. So that's the strength of this first paper and we'll get, I'll, explain a little bit more about that now. What we then wanted to, what we're then going to discuss, and I'm going to hand over to Simone for this, is a, a follow-up paper that we've written on the livelihood impacts of COVID-19 in urban South Africa. And where these papers speak to each other is that in that first paper, using, exploiting this, the feature of, uh, the longitudinal feature of the NIDS data, we could estimate vulnerability to poverty and we developed a social stratification schema, which was really rooted in this vulnerability concept. And when we speak about vulnerability here, we mean vulnerability, the inability to protect oneself and one's household um, against a negative uh, and unexpected shock. Uh, that's one element of vulnerability. And, and COVID represents uh, a large uh, shock of this nature, a large simultaneous shock of this nature. So. So that's where we try to map these findings from this first paper uh, that we did onto, uh, onto the COVID context. And here we used a continuation of this panel, um, uh, the NIDS-CRAM data, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, which uses the same sample as, as this first paper, as the NIDS uh, panel data. And then we supplemented this with some in-depth qualitative uh, interviews. Um, in a way, this was also a qualitative panel because we'd previously done research in 2017 with these same individuals. So we followed them over time as well. But Simone will give us more details about that. All right, so the first paper, I'm gonna give you a very quick 10 minute uh, uh, synthesis of, um, of, of this research. Uh, and there are a couple of things that we wanted to look at and achieve. Um, the first was we wanted to give a descriptive picture of South Africa's uh, social stratification uh, landscape. And as I said before, root this, uh, 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 base this, um, the schema of social stratification on this vulnerability concept of the likelihood that people have of staying, of remaining in poverty, moving out of poverty, um, or falling into poverty. Um, uh, okay, and the, the rest Simone is going to uh, take us through. Um, you can go ahead, Simone. Um, so, and again. All right, uh, so to give you a, uh, a, a summary um, here is what we usually start with when we, when we undertake poverty analysis is we try, we, the, the most basic possible scenario is we measure the number of people who are poor at a given moment in time. Um, and these, th those might be uh, identified as poor because they, their household income falls below a given poverty line. That's a snapshot at a moment in time. This snapshot at a moment in time underestimates the number of people who will experience poverty over time. So, the number of people who are measured as non-poor or amongst the people who are measured as non-poor at a particular moment in time, some of those people have come from poverty and some of those people will fall back into poverty or fall into poverty. Equivalently, some of the non-poor, some of the some of the poor will end up escaping poverty. So it's important to, or what this panel data does, which follows individuals, is it allows us to understand who's moving into and out of poverty, who constitutes the chronically poor, who constitutes the, the stably non-poor, and what is that group that's uh, in between those people moving frequently into and out of poverty. So we do this, as I said, using the National Income Dynamics Study, which was implemented by Seldrew at UCT um, from 2008 to 2017 to provide this uh, dynamic perspective. 
And we can use this, which is, what is a very rich data set to not only observe uh, poverty patterns, but also to use household and individual level characteristics to predict the propensity that individuals face, the, the probabilities that individuals face of falling into poverty if they're not poor or escaping poverty if they are poor. And we use this, this predictive um, approach to divide the population into different class stra strata. All right. So to start with, um, this is just a descriptive snapshot of poverty dynamics in the population. So focusing just on the left-hand side here under total, what we have is the darkest section of the bar represents those people who are observed in five out of five waves of the NIDS panel data. So in, at every point we observe those individuals from 2008 to 2007, the darkest section of these bars represents those people who are observed to be poor in every single one of the five waves. So dark is bad, dark is more often poor, and light is less frequently poor. So the lightest bar represents the proportion of the population which was never poor. And the different shades of blue represent those gradations. So what we can see is that approximately 35% of the total South African population um, was poor consistently in every wave at which we observed them between 2008 and 2017. Only about 15% were consistently not poor. But these these poverty dynamic these uh, these po this po this poverty dynamic landscape is correlated with um, household and individual level characteristics. So Africans, as you can see, Black South Africans um, are much more uh, they're living in a different poverty universe compared to white South Africans. White South Africans are almost always not poor, whereas only uh, just under 10% of black South Africans are, are, were not poor in every wave that we observed them. Um, the same or a similar pattern holds true for education, for, uh, for gender, and for the urban-rural uh, divide, as you can see here, where rural People are more, more often chronically poor uh, than urban people, women more often chronically poor than men, et cetera. All right, and this maps, these, dynam these poverty dynamics also map into, or also have correlates in the, in the employment landscape. So employment contracts, which are temporary um, or self, or those who are working in the informal sector as, as uh, self-employed, um, uh, workers also experience higher rates of chronic poverty and higher rates of, of transient poverty. In particular, the, a large, the, the large majority of those people in unprotected forms of work um, are moving into and out of poverty with some, with some frequency. Few of them are stably non-poor. All right, so using, so with this poverty landscape, Poverty, this landscape of poverty dynamics in mind, um, I'm going to introduce our poverty, uh, our schema of social socioeconomic stratification. Um, and this is going to be useful in Simone's part of the presentation where we map this onto the COVID context. So focusing just on the left-hand side here, on the left-hand side in gray, we've got the standard subdivision of society between poor and not poor. M middle class here is just we can simply understand is not poor, all right? And above that, we've got the elite, which we sort of arbitrarily define as, as much wealthier um, than the rest of society. But this poverty threshold is simply the poverty line. So uh, the status A um, poverty line, which is around 1,300 1, rand per person per month, that's the poverty threshold that we're using here just to divide the non-poor from, from the poor. But then what we do in addition is we try and we, within each group, so focusing just on the poor, within the poor, we, um, we distinguish those with a below average probability of exiting poverty as the chronic poor, and those with a, an above average uh, probability of exiting poverty as the transient poor. Okay, so essentially what we've done is we've further sub subdivided the poor into those who are likely to remain poor and those who are more likely than the rest to escape poverty. We do the same 
for those who are not poor. So for those who are not poor, we, we identify those who have got an above average probability of falling into poverty as the vulnerable and those with an above uh, with a below average uh, probability of falling into poverty as the stable middle class. So we could think of this as the genuine uh, middle class. All right. So what we've done for them for the non-poor is said some of these non-poor are likely to fall into poverty over time. Some of them are going to stay non-poor, and that's a relevant distinction. What we find is that um, uh, actually, could you go back a second, Simon? If you see on the right-hand side here, the transient poor and the, and the vulnerable are, are, are highlighted here. Because what, what we expect is that these people are going to be swapping places frequently over time. The transient poor are going to be below the poverty threshold at any moment in time, but they're likely to move above it over time. And just like the, and the vulnerable as well are above the poverty threshold, but they're likely to move below it. So we expect these two groups to be somewhat similar. We expect them to be swapping their swapping positions over time. All right, we can move on. All right, so applying this schema to the South African data, uh, the NIDS data, we can estimate the size of these different groups for each, year's, for each year of NIDS data that we've got. And what we see is that about half of the South African population is chronically poor. And repeating what I said earlier, what this means is that not only are they poor, but they're unlikely to escape poverty. All right, then about 20% of the population, this is the yellow uh, sub bar here, about 20% of the population is stably middle class. That is, they're not only not poor, but they're also unlikely to become poor. All right, and in the middle, we've got this big chunk of people, about one third of the population, um, which is occupies this, this um, position of precarity, uh, of straddling the po poverty line. Some of them are above the poverty line, some are below, but they're going to be swapping places uh, uh, over time. All right. And um, I'm going to give a quick snapshot of the of the labor, what the labor market characteristics of these of these two groups are. And what we see is that while the chronic poor is most of the chronic poor are simply excluded from the labor market. So the gray bars and the light brown bars here are economically inactive or unemployed. So the vast majority of the chronically poor are simply not in the labor market. That's not the case for the transient poor and the vulnerable. And actually the labor market characteristics, uh, we could go into this in more detail, but a very broad uh, snapshot as I'm presenting here, the, the labor market characteristics are quite similar. And, a, and the, the salient point here is that a lot of them are employed in highly precarious forms of labor where they're unable to avail, avail themselves of the labor market protections, which characterize the, um, the middle class and the elite. All right, I'll end on that um, and hand over to Simone to introduce our work in the COVID context. Thanks a lot. Great, thanks so much, Rocco. And um, yeah, I think you already introduced this research very well. So all what we were just seeing is what we did before COVID hit South Africa. And as Rocco explained, COVID in a way presents this large covariate shock that we can then analyze how those different groups of people who we already know are more or less vulnerable to this types of shock, how they fare during this difficult time. So I'm going to start with some quantitative snapshot from the NITS crumb data, and then we move into our own qualitative field research. Um, so just as probably most of you know, like South Africa was one of the countries most affected by COVID-19. It had one of the earliest and strictest government reaction also to it. So you had a very strict lockdown that lasted from the 27th of March up to basically the 1st of June. So the um, restrictions on movements were only actually relaxed with level three of the lockdown. So we have this relatively long phase of strict um, stay at home orders. And despite these, you see the rise in cases up to basically mid July when cases peaked during the first wave. And during that time, Cape Town um, or the Western Cape Province emerged as one of the hotspots, accounting for about 
of confirmed COVID-19 cases up to July. Um, and these stringent policies had, had an effect on people's welfare levels, as we can see from the NITS crumb data. So here on the left-hand side, you have poverty figures from the 2017 NITS, where you see that about 46% of the population fell below the national upper bound poverty line, and about 19% were food poor by national standards. And if you look at the incidence of people who experienced economic distress with the, in the early phases of the pandemic, we see that about 40% of the household has lost the main source of income since the lockdown had started in March. About 47% of the households ran out of money to buy food in April, so during the phase of the lockdown. And this is not necessarily meaning that they were food insecure, so they could still find other ways to put food on the table but they were clearly under financial distress. And then about 24% um, reported that at least one household member is an adult or a child experienced hunger during May or June. So though this is not directly comparable to the food poverty measure we have for 2017, it gives an indication of a potential rise in food insecurity during this early phase of the pandemic. And this has been confirmed by other papers looking closely at this issue in the early NITS ground waves. Um, when we look at who experienced this type of financial distress during the pandemic, what we see is those who were observed to be poor prior to the pandemic clearly were more exposed to the shock. So they have a higher incidence of experiencing any of those three events since the start of the pandemic. However, you also see that a substantial share of the non-poor experienced this event. So they weren't shielded against the effects of the crisis. And we then wanted to look a bit more closely, like what are the profiles of those people who were experiencing financial distress with the pandemic? And something that we find is that the profiles are quite different from those who we historically know have always been poor in South Africa, basically. So as Rocco showed you before, like from our earlier research with the earlier wave of NITS, we saw that the incidence of poverty was generally much higher in rural compared to urban areas, for example. However, this geographic divide is much less pronounced if you look at the outcomes in 2020. So the gap between rural and urban areas has it's much narrower compared to the standard poverty measures. So urban areas were much more affected than they used to be by normal poverty standards. We also observed that actually the highest incidence of these three measures of financial distress in the early phases of the pandemic are highest among those living in informal housing, so often housing at the fringes of urban societies. So here we see that about half of those living in informal housing had lost the main source of income, about two thirds ran out of money to buy food and about one third actually went hungry in May or June. And if you see like the, this is for, at least for the first two events, it's even higher than those living in traditional housing, mainly concentrated in the rural areas of the country. So you have this kind of urban bias of those who experience financial distress. Another thing that we observe is those who experienced financial distress in 2020 were much more reliant on labor earnings compared to those who had previously been observed to be poor. So previously we observed the highest incidence of poverty among those who were mainly relying on government grants, so who had grant income as a main source of income. Now this financial distress is often experienced by people who, all, who have labor earnings as the main source of income prior to the pandemic or also remittance income. So we have high followers in these two sources of income. So even though we see that the profiles are quite different, so they are significantly more urban, more often living in informal settlements and more reliant on labor earnings, we suppose that many of those who entered into financial distress in 2020 had actually been on the brink of poverty before. So they had faced an elevated risk of falling into poverty and were less well equipped to kind of deal with this type of economic shock, meaning they were more vulnerable. And to test this or to look at this, we use the class schema that Rocco has been talking about before. So we look at classifying people into those 
five classes based on the stratification schema we developed before. So they are class status in 2017. We look at how the frequency of, of the share who experienced this type of three events measuring financial distress in 2020. And what we observe is that exactly those two classes that Rocco highlighted before, so the transient poor and the vulnerable, they were extremely likely to, ex to have lost the main source of income since the lockdown started. And we attribute this to their vulnerable position in the labor market that Rocco was referring to before. We also observed that they were almost as likely as the chronic poor to run out of money to buy food and they had elevated levels of going hungry or food insecurity during the early phases of the pandemic. So this type of volatile, these two volatile groups that had clear markers of ex ante vulnerability actually were more likely to experience financial distress during the pandemic. So this economic shock materialized for them. Okay. And Rocco also mentioned that we had, back in 2017, we had done some field research in Karliče, also with the aim of actually looking at this type of vulnerable groups. So exactly trying to find those people that are transient, poor, or vulnerable, non-poor, and learning more about their lives. And given this pattern that we now observed in the quantitative data, um, our idea was to call back those earlier respondents and see how they were doing during the pandemic and to learn more about how their livelihoods had been affected and kind of dig deeper into their experiences during the lockdown and with the lifting of the lockdown. Um, so what we have here is a two rounds of semi-structured phone interviews with 15 respondents each. So we interviewed the same respondents twice, once in around June, so between 11th of June and 7th of July, and then a second time between the 28th of August and 24th of September, so in September, essentially. Um, and the timing roughly coincides with the two waves of NITS um, data, so it's kind of a similar time frame as we have for the quantitative data that we have been looking at. And yeah, the first wave was collected during level three, so just after the lockdown has been lifted, but we had a number of like recall questions during the interviews, retrospective questions asking about how the situation had been back in February before COVID hit South Africa during the lockdown, say April, and then at the point of the interview. Um, and what is like, in the original study in 2017, we had a combination of focus group discussion and life history interviews involving wealth, wealth ranking exercises across four welfare levels that were endogenously defined within the township context. So here, four is actually the lowest welfare level and one is the highest level within the local township context. And during the life history interviews in 2017, um, we went through with respondents through their lives and tried to figure out what events had happened and have them rank to what extent those were associated with welfare transitions. And we did the similar thing now when interviewing them again. So for each respondent, we have kind of this life course of welfare and we have the self assessment of how the pandemic had affected their life. So this gives us these lines and here I just pick two examples to give you an idea of what this looks like. And basically in all cases, we observe a drop between February and June, and then either a more modest drop or a stabilization or also in some cases a recovery up to September. So this is a type of evidence that we have. Um, I'm running out of time, but I'm trying to give you some of the snapshots of what we find. So the three main messages that basically were from this is that um, the pandemic affected the livelihoods of our respondents in three main ways. So one is the drop in earnings and employment. So it mainly acted through a strong shock to the local labor market. What we also observe is a decreasing resilience to future crisis. So an increased or deepened vulnerability, and I'm quickly going to talk about this, and then elevated levels of psychological distress. And if you're interested, we also wrote this opinion piece 
that's published on News24 in case you want a quick snapshot of our findings. Um, so as I said, the labor market shock was kind of the main threat to people's like livelihoods. So if you see a collapse of survivalist livelihood strategies, um, many small businesses are fully suspending their activities, at least during the lockdown, but often also having difficulties to fully resuming them after. So out of those who were in informal self-employment, only one was operating again at full capacity in September. In addition, we also see a temporary suspension of formal jobs. So those weren't necessarily secure. And we also observe an informalization of these. So for example, here we have this quote of one respondent who had been working in a formal job and then got basically deregistered from social security contributions, which was a clear sign of worry to him. And in addition, we also observe indirect effects through social networks. So even if people didn't have direct access to labor market income, quite frequently um, systems of support dried up because other relatives had lost their jobs and couldn't no longer send the same level of support. And in this context, given the shock to the labor market, um, grant income was quite an important source sustaining people's livelihoods. The second one is this amplified vulnerabilities. So here we see a clear loss of access to both formal and informal insurance mechanism. So given the shock to earnings, we see people defaulting on funeral policies, drawing down savings, witnessing um, rotating savings associations disintegrate as people were in, no longer able to contribute to these. And these clearly put people in a more vulnerable position considering potential future crisis. In addition, we also observe that children were struggling with homeschooling, often not having access to the technical equipment to continue schooling while schools were closed. And this may put a limit or could constrain future social upward mobility. And again, we have a few quotes here on this. And then the third channel is this increased level of psychological distress. So here we observe kind of a general sense of loss of individual control and agency during the pandemic. So this was partly due to the fear of the virus itself, which mainly affected those with families and older people. But we also observed this kind of inse more insecure position in the labor market that was particularly worrying um, younger males in our sample. And overlapping with this, we also observe kind of elevated levels of domestic abuse and from two key informants that we talked with who also pointed to potentially increase in crime, um, which could add to this more insecure and volatile environment people were facing. Um, yeah, so summarizing basically from the qualitative research, we have these three main channels that stood out that kind of led to a deepening of vulnerability. So this is the decline in labor earnings and employment prospects the increased exposure to present and future economic shocks, and this general sense of loss of individual control and agency. And our findings give rise to concerns that the COVID-19 pandemic may not only be a temporary shock, but have lasting implications through these. So I'm gonna stop here and thank you very much and looking forward to see you as comments. Thank you. Thanks, Simone. Uh, Saviwe, go ahead. Good afternoon and thank you to Rocco and Zamone for the very insightful presentation. I'm sure that many will agree um, that you've provided us with some very useful um, context for understanding the social and economic crisis that we're seeing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so some key things that stood out to me uh, while engaging with both of these studies was firstly the need for more longitudinal analyses like these to understand the reality of the highly unequal nature of the South African economic system, but also how it's experienced by the poor and working class. And that while you know, there have been some changes in South Africa in terms of um, political freedoms and to a certain extent, uh, economic freedoms um, as demonstrated by the rapid growth in the African middle class in your paper, it is striking that race and gender continue to be key determinants for poverty persistence and vulnerability uh, to poverty in the post-apartheid period. 
And so while these findings may not necessarily be um, surprising for those of us who are engaged in this type of work, I think that it's very important to show these realities, um, especially now in thinking about the kinds of policies that will be required, um, you know, moving into the post COVID-19 uh, economic recovery. And it's clear from this presentation that um, there is a great need for economic policies that recognize the multidimensional inequalities that many South Africans are faced with. Um, but also going forward, um, economic policies need to be targeted at protecting livelihoods, um, but also creating an enabling environment for more and more people to move or transition out of poverty. An important finding um, that these studies have shown is that a majority of South Africans are either chronically poor or they lead precarious livelihoods and that this has been exacerbated by the um, global health and economic crisis with those, um, as you show, uh, were, who were initially um, non-poor um, now falling into poverty as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And at the same time, uh, consistent with the recent international studies, both of the papers have shown that food poverty is also on the rise. And this raises some serious concerns when we also consider that, once again, um, you know, race and gender uh, play a determining uh, uh, role in people's vulnerability to high levels of food um, insecurity around the world, and that women and children in particular are more likely um, to experience you know, food insecurity um, despite uh, women's critical role um, in sustaining livelihoods around um, the world. Um, and as uh, the Livelihoods Impact Report uh, presented here today suggests, um, during the lockdown period, poor household faced um, additional pressures on their budgets, leaving many prone to food poverty as a result. In addition, um, both of these studies argue that employment and employment type are key determinants of um, poverty status among individuals and households of the South African population. And I think um, you know, this is uh, very important um, to show, given the fact that in recent years, there have been a lot of studies to show kind of the growing precariousness of work in the post apartheid period, but not many you know, um, have really explored the relationship between um, work and livelihoods. And I think both of these studies do a very good job of showing that. Um, an important contribution that these studies have made therefore is showing the nuances of inequality in South Africa and how poverty isn't as you know, clear cut as it's commonly understood and that it can't just be characterized as only the poor or the middle class and that rather seeing and understanding the reality of poverty in the South African context as a spectrum with varying degrees of vulnerability based on household and individual level characteristics may help to determine the types of policies that are required by each of um, the groups that you identified going forward. So um, some key policy takeaways um, that you highlighted in um, the first paper with the longitudinal analysis on poverty were the closing the skills gap and increasing the quantity and quality of jobs, understanding and supporting those working in more precarious forms of work, so as to raise stability, productivity, and real earnings, ensuring the provision of basic services and that the health, education, and nutritional needs of the chronically poor are met, and finally, the need for social transfers of the basic income for the chronically poor. Uh, however, specifically in regard to um, the point on you know, closing the skills gap, it has been argued um, that the problem isn't so much the supply of low um, or high quality labor that determines the supply of good or bad jobs um, in the economy, and that rather what we're seeing in the post apartheid period is more so the replacement of you know, full-time stable jobs in the formal sector with low, uh, low wage, unstable um, and insecure jobs that are characterized by informality and the lack of social protections, a trend which um, your livelihoods impact report uh, suggests has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, 
with rising informality and increased instability in some sectors following the national lockdown. And so therefore, it can be argued also that you know, policies to protect workers and ultimately the sanctity of work need to be prioritized um, at the same time, if not more than those that are you know, simply uh, based on skills development. And as these studies have highlighted as well, there is an important role for the state to play in the provisioning of um, social protections and social services that are also not work-based to you know, save lives, but also to protect the livelihoods of um, the chronically poor and the large numbers of unemployed in South Africa. And this is you know, particularly important when we also consider the critical role that expanded social uh, protections uh, during the lockdown uh, played in sustaining these livelihoods as also demonstrated in um, the report. Finally, um, I think one thing that I think future uh, studies could explore a little further are the gendered impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic amongst the poor in South Africa and the role that uh, women have played in securing livelihoods at a time where, as your study um, suggests, uh, where the coping and informal insurance mechanisms had been compromised. Um, and this is particularly important because, um, you know, there are studies that have shown an increased um, that, you know, as a result of the health and, and, and economic crisis, they, the burden of dependent care work um, that women have had to engage in throughout their everyday lives um, uh, has also uh, increased with many women having to balance paid and unpaid care work in the households. And at the same time, estimates from the UN Women Gender Equality in the Wake of um, COVID-19 report also suggest um, that the feminization of poverty will be exacerbated as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and that um, about 47 million more women and girls are expected to be in extreme poverty by the end of this year, with every 100 men, 118 um, women also being expected to be in extreme poverty uh, by the end of 2021. In addition, um, and as the livelihood impact report presented here today suggests, there's also been, you know, and uh, uh, there's um, there has also been an increase in domestic violence predominantly against women. Um, however, despite evidence of these gender trends and vulnerability to the COVID-19 pandemic, little attention is being paid to the kinds of policies that are required for protecting women and girls in the you know, medium to long term, but also um, a, a, and uh, the advancing efforts towards um, gender equality in the long run. So um, therefore, feminist interventions such as increasing social protection, recognizing the informal economy and supporting it, as well as supporting the invisible unpaid um, care work that women engage in to sustain livelihoods, um, I think will be critical for addressing issues of poverty and inequality going into the recovery. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sabiwe, for that um, insightful response. Um, I'm going to hand over to Rocco and Simone to reflect on some of the points that you have raised. And then I'm going to take questions. Um, so if anybody has a question, please will you raise your hand or write it in the chat? Uh, thank you. Yeah, maybe I can start and then Rocco can come in. Um, yeah, thanks to you for this I think very good reflection and very good summary of some of the main messages that emerge from the papers and I fully agree on the important gender dimension of COVID and the studies you cited. Unfortunately, in our work, as we have a relatively small qualitative sample, we couldn't get deeply into these gender differences, but I fully agree. And also we have a similar other study on Ghana, actually, where we see this gendered effects on female workers. So females being overrepresented in this kind of informal, unstable labor market spectrum, and therefore also seeing their earnings and employment prospects collapse more and recovering more slowly compared to male workers. So I definitely think there is an important gender dimension 
which we couldn't fully cover in this work, basically. Um, yeah, I think we were like when we did this stratification research, and of course we were kind of concerned about this vulnerable spectrum or transient poor and vulnerable spectrum and knowing that they were more exposed to shock. But we were, or at least I was when first seeing this kind of statistics of how they experienced the crisis across those groups and seeing that they were so similar in the exposure and actually how this shock manifested in an increased vulnerability and really dragging those people into a more difficult situation was kind of shocking to me. And we do see some signs of recovery in the later waves of NITSCRAM and also in our second round of interviews. But yeah, it remains to be seen like how long lasting these effects are. And I think that the effect on education, like specifically, um, can be varying, even though, as you said, like education, it's no guarantee of receiving a stable job afterwards, but it is one of the enablers of social mobility for sure. And it's one of the channels through which um, COVID-19, I think, may have um, lasting implications for future social upward mobility. Um, and the same, as you mentioned, like there's a varying trend of people, jobs being kind of informal, like formal jobs being potentially informalized or losing stability with the crisis, um, which I think are those kind of more long-term varying trends that we need to keep in mind. Um, Rocker, did you wanna come in or react? Yeah, sure. No, uh, first of all, thanks to viewer for really thoughtful reflections. Um, yeah, that was great. I've taken notes um, and we'll think about this. Uh, just a couple of comments that I made. I wanna make a couple of comments on the, um, on the quality and quantity of work uh, discussion. So apart from the COVID context, it seems like to the extent that there's a trade-off between the quality and the quantity of jobs in, in the economy and the policies that would support increase, increasing the quantity of jobs versus the quality of jobs, um, to the extent that there is that trade-off, um, it seems like, I think what our, what our research does is allows us to crystallize the what policy question and what potential consequences that trade-off might have in terms of the policy, the, the poverty landscape. So going back to our schema, we can think of there being three classes really, that the chronically poor, who don't have, I mean, I'm gonna to simplify to the point of the distortion here, but the chronic poor who for all intents and purposes don't have jobs, there's a, they're the vulnerable, those who are straddling the poverty line, who often have jobs, but have a very precarious attachment to the labor market. And then they're the middle class who have, who have stable, permanent, generally well-paid positions, uh, which insulate them to some extent from shocks. So if, if we want to, let's, if we, let's ask the question, do we wanna grow the middle class? Okay, then we gotta improve the quality of jobs. And what that'll essentially do is move people out of the vulnerable class, straddling the poverty line into the middle class. Okay, then we'll get a bigger middle class. But maybe we wanna move people out of chronic poverty and into this vulnerable space, uh, which is still far better than chronic poverty. And then we might wanna increase the quantity of jobs. So to the extent that there is a trade-off between those two, those two, we can see through our schema what consequences that would have on the poverty landscape. Maybe they're complementarities between improving quality and quantity at the same time and they're creative solutions. But anyway, it's, maybe it's one way of looking at that policy challenge. The other thing is, not from a policy perspective is just to just I, and I think an open question is what has COVID has the COVID-19 shock on the labor market done to this picture has it not through some policy intervention but through but just through the pure shock to the labor market um, has it increased uh, this vulnerable the size of this vulnerable group by sort of in decreasing the size of the middle class, for instance, or has it decreased the size of the vulnerable group by swelling the size of the chronic poor uh, or something else, you know? And I think that's an open question that, that will, um, uh, will, need, will still need to be answered. Um, oh, I'll stop there. Thanks, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, 
Um, but I'm quickly going to come in with my own question and reflection. Um, in, in response to what you've just said, Rocco, I think that we are very happy to acknowledge the trade-off when it comes to policy interventions in the context of limited resources in these types of conversations. But the reality is when we set those policies or we set or we um, formulate our kind of strategic visions or you know, guiding documents, there's less willingness to make clear what those trade-offs are and to sacrifice one option um, in order to achieve the other. So whether it's like you're saying now, there's a trade-off or some balanced um, negotiation between quantity and quality of jobs. Uh, the question that came to my mind when I read these papers was, there's a clear impact of the loss of earnings and the loss of employment prospects um, on people's livelihoods, which the second paper showed. But at the same time, you identified this tenuous attachment to the labor market and kind of caveat your findings that in fact, the reason it doesn't look as bad as it probably is um, with when, when you look at the impact of job loss on livelihoods is because so few people have jobs to begin with. Um, and, then, and then you talk about the, the minimal risk management mechanisms that people have. And I'm not sure if you mean that in terms of livelihood strategies within the household or as I understood it, um, as kind of social protection measures embedded in jobs. But if there's such a tenuous relationship with jobs in the first place, is it really worthwhile for our um, poverty alleviation strategies to be so um, tied to this ideal of creating employment for people? Or should we see that as a much more explicit trade-off between whether it's a basic income grant or some form of uh, some form of grant versus some type of active labor market intervention. And I think that um, Sibosis's question in the chat is related to this. He asks, what are the policy implications for this work? How should policymakers prepare for the next macroeconomic shock? And what should be, um, what role should be played by the public and private sectors? Saviwe so touched um, at a high level on what policy implications your paper discusses, but perhaps you could go into some more depth. Sorry, can I come in quickly on that, Simone? Um, there was a, there's a lot there, so uh, I apologize in advance for not touching, uh, yeah, for I'm sure missing some things. Um, and in response to CVUS question as well, uh, something interesting that we found was so in, in 2017, when we spoke to um, when we spoke to our respondents in Kailicha, a lot of them spoke about hustling in the township as uh, and working peace jobs in particular as something somehow degrading. So working peace jobs in that social stratification schema that we introduced to our respondents in Kailicha, working peace jobs was 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 characteristic of the bottom strata of society. You worked peace jobs if you had nothing better to do. Uh, you know, if you couldn't get a good job uh, in, in, the, uh, yeah, in the sort of formal economy, then you worked peace jobs. Suddenly in the COVID context, these peace, jo these peace jobs uh, to a large extent disappeared for a, short, for, for a short period of time. So when we spoke to these people in 2017, they spoke somewhat disparagingly about peace jobs. Now in 2020, they spoke nostalgically about, about peace jobs, you know, it's the absence and all of this, all of the, this is just to say, these are survivalist livelihood activities. Isn't, there's nothing aspirational about w working bad jobs, um, but they are, they are an indispensable often uh, means of surviving. And the same, and, and the same thing I think applies to grants. No one aspires to a basic income grant. You know, no one aspires to the special COVID grant. Um, but if grants were to be taken away, their real importance would be revealed for what it is, which is sort of, in many cases, the sort of cornerstone of household lively, uh, livelihood strategies, strategies in South Africa. So um, 
anyway, what, what do we learn from that? I don't think people, I don't think people aspire to be supported by, by the government um, through, through grants. Um, but at the same time, that doesn't mean for a second that the support uh, that, that households get through grants isn't something which should be uh, encouraged and supported. And to Sibusiso's question, a question, uh, 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 I think what would have been a more appropriate policy response in the South African context and which what we can learn uh, next time is, is do more and do it much quicker in terms of the, the social policy, the social protection, which is extended by the government. There must be, and I think this is a consensus which is emerging more or less universally is there need to be mechanisms in place for governments to quickly uh, um, distribute emergency relief uh, uh, to populations in, in, in moments of crisis like this. Um, not as a solution, but as a, as, as a, as what it is, a sort of a extending a, um, uh, a means of survival to, 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 to households. Um, I think there was much more to your question, but perhaps Simone uh, has something else to say as well. Um, yeah, thank no, I fully agree with the points you made. I mean, it's kind of hard to have a, a full solution to it, but I think, as you said, like we have seen that grants were extremely important in sustaining the livelihoods, at least with the initial shock, but as you say, people don't want to rely on those grants. And also it's still little income, right? So we also had a number of respondents who were basically relying on one pension grant, but as their children had lost their jobs, the whole extended household was relying on this one grant. So it's, it is an important floor to sustain livelihoods at the minimum, but it's not enough to actually keep people out of poverty. So this kind of labor market recovery would be really important in that sense. But it's also something, as you were saying, South Africa has been struggling with way before COVID already. Um, and yeah, it's hard to say how to fully, or I don't think there's easy fixes here essentially. And the problems are kind of still the same as they were before. They just um, got more exposed potentially with the pandemic. Um, we have just a few minutes left. So if anybody else wants to ask a question, um, I don't see any hands raised. Um, uh, if I've got, I, I can say something if anyone's thinking, oh, here you go. Um, I'll just read this out aloud from Yako, Rocco mentioned something important that no one aspires to be supported by the government. I assume this is for average rational individuals. Do you know if there's been, there have been studies looking into how rational individuals are? I think the general comment always seems to come. I know of person X that got five children just to get an increased amount of grants. If this holds true, then could it perhaps be seen as irrational? Everything that I've seen, for instance, the child support grant is is not that is is that. The child support grant has not increased fertility, uh, for instance, um, and it sort of goes, yeah, I mean, it is a really small amount. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think there's any evidence that, that, at least in the South African context, at the level that the child support grant is, is set at, that, that people, that there's a fertility response to, uh, to child support grants. Um, Um, all right, uh, uh, or education um, uh, to, in response to the co Megan's comment. The other comment that I want to make both to Megan and Siviwa's comment is on this on precarious work. And let's say in this big group of people in the middle of the, this one third of the population, which, which is vulnerable in our schema, what we see is that they, is they're moving into and out of poverty a lot. And a lot of these, a lot of these movements into and out of poverty are precipitated by um, movements into and out of a job. Okay, uh, so there's a lot of churn in the labor market, which is which is underpinning this vulnerability. 
Now, what is the what are the inequality consequences? What are the consequences of this labor market churn on inequality? Okay, and ex ante, it's it's ambiguous, right? In, in one in one way, if people are swapping jobs all the time, then they're sharing the jobs, and everyone else and everyone is more equal over time, right? So th there's one mechanism which is which is in which is equality which is pro equality, right? There's another mechanism which is anti-egalitarian, anti-equality, which is that high wage workers keep their jobs and low wage wor workers switch their jobs, uh, switch into and out of unemployment. So imagine someone who earns uh, 10,000 Rand a month and someone who earns 1,000 Rand and another person who's unemployed. Then you follow them, you see them in the next period. The person who earns 10,000 Rand earns 10,000 Rand again and the two, and the person who earns a thousand rand is now unemployed, and the person who was previously unemployed now earns a thousand rand. So, if you sum those incomes over those two periods, what you've got is greater inequality over time than what you observed at a point in time. All right. So there are two dynamics here. There's the churn might be equalizing. All right. If if churn is uncorrelated with income at the moment in time, or it could be inequality increasing if the churn is correlated with income, right? And these two processes co-occur. Me and another co-author, Vimal, did a paper on this recently, and we find that, uh, that over the short term, in fact, using the NIDS data, we find that inequality, this churn, is leading to increased inequality in the short term. So this churn is, um, is on net inequality increasing in South Africa. Anyway, for, 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 for what it's worth. Um, but I thought it related to to that discussion of of do we want to really be do we want to really be uh, increasing the number of vulnerable jobs is that a is that a sort of laudable worthy developmental goal uh, in South Africa or is the sort of uh, jobs at at all costs discourse just sort of barking up the wrong tree in in a context in which uh, employment uh, universal employment is a pipe dream um, I don't think we well at least. I don't think we have a, a clear answer to that to that question. Uh, I know we're over time. Yes, we have run out of time, unfortunately. Um, I think there's a lot more to say, um, but um, we'll have to leave that for another day. Um, just to close, I think one of the most striking things when reading the paper is how you often describe the findings as distressing but unsurprising. And when you see just the vast proportion of South Africans that are affected by poverty. Um, it, it's quite scary that we've gotten to a point where it's unsurprising. Anyway, um, but thanks everybody for joining.